strong and then you go through other phases um, and so right now we've been trying to just acknowledge that if you know Kane and if you know of his cycles then you know how to work with him and you understand how as he changes how we as people have to change in accordance to him um, and the same as Kanaloa Kanaloa being that subconscious um, that subconscious element that deep ocean element that's rising and just as Kanaloa is it is a slow rise right it's hard for us to actually visualize those changes we see the flooding a little bit more for us we see areas that are underwater um, going to continue to be underwater because Kanaloa, Kanaloa is now kind of in charge of all of those aspects So as I was saying, the, the cycles of our Akuas have always been there, yeah, and they're always going to continue. It's we as Kanaku who have to change and adapt to the Akua right now. We have to adapt. We have to make sure we're protecting ourselves. We have to acknowledge he's there. Um, it's a lot easier to kilo things like the clouds, um, to the, kilo the rain, and understand how those things are changing. Um, and that's what we encourage people to do as we go through climate change is just to be present in these moments to acknowledge the roles that they have if you understand that Kane is going to have a really strong presence um, how do you react to that? what are your reactions? the auditor is saying the, um, the insurance auditor for the state of Hawaii is saying at some point pretty soon uh, the hotels aren't going to be insured anymore Ooh. right? just like your Hale, right? if you're in a flood zone Pretty soon they're going to cut off your insurance, right? What's going to happen when they cut off the insurance to Waikiki? It's just going to piholo, and that's fine. Hopefully, maybe our Kanaka and all our people who work there can then go and plant kalo or grow our food. <laughs> you know, like we can adapt because like you said, the Kanaka are going to be here. We're going to feel the changes. But if we are true Kanaka, just like our kupunas, we will adapt with it. Because the only way our people have survived this long is through adaptation, right? We are the survivors of less than 10% of our kupuna. We are the survivors. And those survivors are the ones that came on the va, and they're the survivors of their people. So us as Kanaka, as long as you're pili to your aina, and you change with your aina, we will be here through climate change. Um, and that's a, that's a strong thing to think about. It's like I said, even as this movement goes, it's our time to rise and claim our aina and be pili to it. <coughs> if we understand how the flooding is happening, then we can react to it. We can net certain things. We can make sure the kahavais are flowing correctly. Um, so I feel, I mean, I hope that climate change is just another impetus to help us as Kanaka get PD to our Aina again and understand how Kane is moving through our landscape, how Kanaloa is rising. Um, have you guys seen sea level rise where you're from? Yeah. How much has sea level risen in Hawaii so far? Anybody know? So I've done most of my, real, um, I was telling them before, I'm from Puna here in Hawaii Island um, and I did my dissertation work in climate change a while ago before most people knew what it was um, and I studied surfing, I studied ocean currents um, and so I, surfing has a lot of different environmental factors and so I look at the sea level rise in Hilo. Sea level rise in Hilo is one foot over the last 100 years. So Hilo, Keokaha area itself has seen over a foot. Kapoho had seen almost three feet. Um, but the difference is that a lot of the, what we have here in Hawaii is in Hawaii sea level rise, and this is where you have to know your kanaka, your akuas. So Pele is the akua of this aina, right? So Pele has actually been sinking Hawaii Island with her presence, because she is such a strong, heavy force. She actually pushes Hawaii down, and she makes us heavier, and we've been sinking for a long time. And so if you look at the sea level rise charts, they're never a solid rise or fall. And that's because there's so many things that affect sea level rise. So here in Hilo, the volcano, Pele herself, changes how much sea level rises on our island. Sea level, Pele is the reason that Oahu has not seen that much sea level rise. And it's the reason that Kauai has not been sinking. Kauai has not seen sea level rise over the last hundred years because of Pele's presence. So she comes here in Hilo on Hawaii Island and she pushes us down and because she pushes us down, Kauai actually rises because our islands are floating on that magma that, that Wakea beneath us that um, um, Ku'u was telling us about before. 
And so here in Hawaii, and everywhere in the world, that's what's confusing about climate change is everyone's going to feel the effects differently, but every one of our mokupunis are going to feel it differently as well because our akuas are different on every one of our island and we have to know who they are on our island. So here on Hawaii Island, we mahalo Pele for her presence. Um, but as you see now, as sea level is rising, she's not as active anymore. And so she's actually, you know, letting us, we're not feeling the effects of sea level rise as much as we were before because she hasn't been as present. Um, but if Mauna Loa decides to bless us soon, as we think she is, again, that's going to make um, the ocean, the sea level rises here in Hawaii Island much greater, much quicker. So all these things we have to maka'ala, um, and it's not things that can be predicted. Uh, any questions on, on that or what I was sharing? You know, sea level rise is one of those that it's, it's so abstract. But at the same time, you can measure it, yeah? You can see it. And um, you see it the most on those high tides, yeah? When you, on those big moons and the Hilo moons, that's when you go out and you can actually start measuring. But no, it's not gonna be a gradual level, yeah? Just like our Piholoin, um, Hawaii Island, it's, it comes in spurts. Um, so everything we're gonna see is gonna be these big changes, like the floods. Floods are big changes that happen very quickly. Um, and that's what we're seeing with the Kane and Kanaloa is that their presence isn't a Malie presence. You know, um, they're Akuas. They, they're they very powerful here in Hawaii. And, um, that's something I've been starting to learn because I think here in Hawaii we're used to our big climate differences, um, big storms coming, big hurricanes, you know, maybe a tsunami, an earthquake. We're, we're used to feeling our Akua. But when I talk to people on Turtle Island, when you talk to people from the continent, it's really different because things change very slowly there. They don't see changes the way we do. When they get rain, they don't get huge, um, huge rainstorms like we do. Yeah, they don't have that pounding rain. They don't have um, their summers come very steadily. They go through their four seasons. It's a gentle change the years. I mean, we don't have that in Hawaii um, and in the rest of the Polynesia, our different Pacific islands. Everything we feel is very sudden, very abrupt. Um, but again, that's that awakening, right? The Akuas are, are telling you hi and they're there present with you. So what kinds of things are Kanaka doing to prepare for the coming of Kanaloa or the changes in Kane? Yeah, so the um, changes in Kane and Kanaloa are something that I think I encourage everyone to do individually to really start understanding your rains. Um, I know we have our books that tell us the, the names of our rains, our Lilinoi, um, here in Puna, we have our different uh, ala ones, but are those uas the same uas that our kupuna felt? You know, are they coming at different times? Um, can you say that the tuahine rain that I see in Manoa is the same tuahine rain that my, that you know somebody's kupuna saw? Um, we have to mock all of that and see. And so our first adaptation is just knowing who they are, knowing these different um, akuas as they come to us. Um, the second one is I think that adaptation that we do. To me, is just to become more pili to that spaces, and so our people who are being farmers, our lavaia, you know, they just have to be makaala about what's going on and really start internalizing those changes and not assuming um, the life cycles that our animals had in the past are the same that we have today. Maybe uu aren't um, spawning in April anymore. You know, we might have to switch some of those things. And so I know the a lot of our, you know, a lot of our huis that are on their aina, they're doing that. They're keeping those moon calendars. They're keeping those aimalama. Um, and that's why I think aimalama is so important because that'll allow us to shift as our akua shift um, and to change with them. Something about kane too, like how when we talk about rainfall patterns, again, it's something that we listen to on the radio all the time or the news report and they tell us what's coming. And I think we need to get better about expecting what's coming um, and knowing how to, um, not to forecast, but to know what's coming toward us. So again, here in Hilo, where I've done most of my research, um, we've had a decline in rainfall for 40 years now. It's not something that's coming. We've been seeing it for 40 years. It's a really big change. Um, I talk about Mauna Kea a lot in, um, when I talk about climate change because as a, as a kid growing up in Mount Kapuna, 
um, I never saw Mauna Kea. It was a rare event to see her because she was always covered in clouds. Every morning it was covered in clouds. Afternoon, we'd always have that afternoon rain because of the heat. Um, but now I see her every morning and it's it's beautiful but eha at the same time because I'm not supposed to see her. That means there's no vibe. Holy Ahu isn't visiting us anymore. I think we saw her twice maybe this last year. And it's, I mean, when you see her, it's beautiful, but she is no longer draping. Her A'ahu isn't there. Um, and so what do we do as our Akuas disappear? How do we respond to that? Um, we need to call their names. A lot of that we talk about is we need to activate them, right? We have to acknowledge that Kanaloa is coming, that he is here. We have to welcome him um, and not being scared. So being too scared about it, being angry about um, you know, carbon sequestration or, you know, any of these big fossil fuel things isn't going to help us. Um, I think as we're seeing on the Mauna, Kapu Aloha is what's going to help us. Having that Aloha for our kuas. Um, and you Aloha them by knowing them. Yeah, you can't love someone that you don't know. So if you don't understand <coughs> your ua that's coming, who Kane is as he greets you, um, how will he respond, you know? So I think there, I think our kuas are just saying it's time for you to recognize us again like let us know who you are let us be present with you um so lily noin poliahu maybe she'll bless us soon i mean we used to have snow in july all the time as a kid i mean that was something that you know you're always surprised by like oh it's you know snowing in summertime but it snowed in summer a lot when i was a kid so maybe all this activation of poliahu chanting her name every day or every you know three hours of protocol maybe we're going to be calling her to us let's bring those energies to us just like every morning as we're getting kane hoalani as we're greeting wakea as he rises um, to me that's like what i really hope people get to do is just activate our hoas activate those energies um, activate mauna loa let her let her flow and then it'll change what happens on this island Anything else? Any, yeah. Well, they say climate change is, will be irreversible and for all of us over here. Is there a contingency plan for that? Or just nothing? Yeah, I think that's why um, it, when I hear Auntie Kalenu Uhiva say that it's a climate emergency, that's when I know, okay, I'm not just being biased from my scientific field. Like Kanaku who are in seeing our aina know that we're going through those changes. Um, it will be irreversible and I think we're already past a lot of that mark. The lucky thing is here in Hawaii is we are so blessed. I mean Hawaii really is um, going to be, it's going to survive this. We're a high islands, all of our islands are going to survive the climate rise. Places like Waikiki, places along the coastline, they might get inundated. I mean I think those things have to net in. Um, and that's it's eha for us, but our people have always moved. We we are migrate, you know, we migrate. You migrate with Panaloa. You don't fight him. Building seawalls is not an answer. Building rock walls is not an answer. That's fighting your akua. Um, you have to um, all the different kanavais that you learn about, like ho'okiki kanavai, the kanavai. Those are the like environmental laws that our kapuna wrote about. Those environmental laws say that water needs to flow. So the flooding needs to happen. We need to adjust to it. So that is one thing like if we do push our government to do is to prepare for it and not to hide their head in the sand and think that um, we can just change. So I do believe that the water is going to rise. Waikiki is going to flood. Um, all of the areas that used to be fish ponds, you know, are still going to be fish ponds again. Kaka'aku is going to reclaim itself, all of that area. Um, and so the faster we can adjust to that, I think, is the best way we can do it. Um, and so Kanaka getting involved in it and saying we want these things to change. We want to change our infrastructure. We want to stop building seawalls. We want to stop breaking rock walls and stopping Kanaloa from rising. Those things aren't the answer. The answer is to, to accept our kuas as they, as they greet us um, and respond to it. Um, so growing our food, you know, all those things are things that we can do. Um, but yeah, I don't, the way our rainfall, rainfall is the one that's hardest. You know, we are blessed with trade winds here in Hawaii and our trade winds bring our rain. Um, and as that climate cycle changes, I mean, that is going to be something that's going to impact. Oahu has felt it when you have, used to blame it on the vlog before. And I used to go to, because I commute, right? From Hilo to, from Puna to Oahu every week. 
So if Puna doesn't have Vog, then Oahu doesn't have Vog. When Puna doesn't have Vog and Oahu says they have Vog, they have smog. They're sitting in their own waste. And that's something that you're going to see more and more. Because the trade winds is what blesses Hawaii and keeps all of our smog out. All of the junk that we produce, all of the cars, thousands of cars that we have on Oahu um, are offset. Um, and so as we really need our trade winds to keep us clean. Uh, but it's, it's now as you see, without the VOG, you, you can't blame Pele anymore for it. It's not Oahu. Um, because we, we have it in Hilo too, but you can tell the difference between it. Um, so the trade winds are what, without the trade winds to cool us down, it's really going to change the urban Honolulu district the most. So our urbanized areas are really going to hit hard. The areas that are, you know, have more plants that can create their own environment, you know, create their own vibe because they're pulling in water because there's trees. Those are the areas that, you know, that can adjust and adapt to it. Um, so planting trees, no matter where you are, even on your lanai in a um, in a apartment building, you know that will bring vai, and that's what we're gonna have to do. Is we're gonna make sure we have to make sure we're bringing kane to us in his vai form, because um, that's how Hawaii is gonna be impacted the most. Our aquifers are already being tapped. Um, I've witnessed the aquifer in Honolulu. They um, you can go and you used to be able to go and see it. Um, uh, I guess over 10 years ago now. Uh, but you can see the aquifer being depleted and so that is again another one of those acknowledging your akua and know that when you're drinking vai, you know when you're taking a bath you're relying on kane to come to you through all these cycles and it uh, just not taking your akua for for um what is that called um, take it for granted taking it for granted yeah kule was talking earlier about you know once you once you call papa you know your earth mother and Haumea you know you see her differently after and you acknowledge it all and that's the same thing we say with climate change so not to say a scary word all the time but to acknowledge these are the same Okua that have been with our people for hundreds of years um, and just acknowledging who they are and what they're doing and being present as those changes occur because they are coming and they have been here for a long time Any questions? I know I keep opening up to questions. I have a um, mm -hmm. I'm a long time surfer, and mm -hmm. so I've always wanted to swell and win. And this last winter on the North Shore in particular, we saw a lot of west swells and west winds, mm -hmm. which is really unusual. Normally there's a morning sickness out of pipeline, and then we wait for the trades to kick in, and then it cleans up, and then like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, it's on. It's been an early morning pipeline session, glassy west swell, and then it blows on shore. It's just, it's really, really different. Is there any um, symbolism to the energy coming from the west? The, the swell and the, and the makani, is there, what is the Okui trying to tell us there? I know there's a message in the western pattern. Yeah, yeah, it's something, so our, um, we have our Polohiva Akane and Polohiva Kanaloa, right? And so the Polohiva Kanaloa is that western side, okay. and that's the Kanaloa coming. Yeah, so that is that change. So we're getting the change in how our oceans move, which changes our weather patterns, which then changes those trade winds that are coming. But it all comes with Kanaloa. And to me, that's that interesting. It's that, um, so Kanaloa is our kua. He's not just the ocean itself. He's also that subconscious element, right? That is kind of within you, which is why he's not talked about a lot. He's not one of those akuas that a lot of us known about because that's, that's who he is. He's the guy inside. Um, and I feel that's that change that's coming, is this internal movement that's changing. Um, and it's going to change us in really interesting ways. It's changing the organism of the sand, of the beach. Yeah, because it's shifting differently. It's so different out there. Yeah. So that western swell is something that we see here on Hawaii Island a lot too. Um, and so when I, um, I did, like I said, I did a lot of my research on surfing. I, I did it here in Honolii. Okay. Um, but surfers, because they have to understand the weather patterns to surf. Especially here in Honolii, we don't have a coral reef, so we don't have a papa that stays still. Our papa moves with the changing um, river flow, the changing water flow, the different wave currents, so you have to understand all those elements. Um, and when you look at the wave record, um, the wave height has been decreasing for 40 years. 
So all of these changes happened simultaneously on Hawaii Island at least 40 years ago. Our wave heights, our wave directions have been changing, our stream flow, our rainfall, um, and our trade winds have all changed for a long time now. And that changes the surf in different ways. Um, what we've seen out here is a lot of more northern swells. And again, because that's that western wrap, it kind of creates a north swell here. And so, um, but the surf spots continue, yeah. right? Yeah. So like you're still able to go, but you need to change adapt. with your surf yeah, and yeah. adapt with yeah. it. And so that was, um, I think that is why when I first got into climate change research, I think it was more of an eha side, like, oh my God, it's, yeah, no poliaho anymore. What are we going to do? And then as I interviewed surfers, I really changed my mindset about it because when I interview them, the uncles who've been surfing there for 50 years, they still love surfing today as much as they did when they were 20, when they were 30, when they were 40. And that's because they are with their Akuas and they have adapted with their Akuas to that place of Honolulu. So the surf was different when they were 20, but not just the surf was different, they were different. You were a different person when you were 20 than when you were 30 than when you were 40. And so they've changed with their environment as the climate, as the environment has changed. And to me, that's just amazing. It is the, um, it shows us what our future is like. If we are in tune with their environment as it changes, we're gonna still love Hawaii as much now as we did 10 years ago and 20 years ago. There might be hotter days. We're gonna have to get used to that. We're gonna have to greet Kane, we're gonna have to prepare ourselves for it. Um, but yeah, surfers to me has taught me that. Hi'iaka surfed Honolulu. She is our Akua of all time and she surfed Honolulu just as people today, if you go back to Hilo on your way out of here, go and surf Honolulu and greet Hi'iaka where she was. You know, she has been to these places. So these surf sites, as much as the environment we know is changing, um, they're still greeting us and they're still there for us today. Yeah. But I think until you start thinking about it, you don't really notice it. So to me, yeah, Hawaiians, Kanaka, you talk about mahi ai, but to me the surfers are the ones that we can go to for kind of hope. And knowing that, yeah, it might not be a mid-morning surf session anymore. It might be a mid-morning instead of a pre-dawn one, and that's what the uncles down there tell me, like, yeah. yeah. That offshore breeze isn't coming as much anymore, or you gotta wait for it, or it heats up earlier. Yeah. So yeah, I haven't done the, the, um, the reports or anything on Oahu, but when I was doing my research, they were really interested on how it would change the whole surf industry <coughs> or all this and that and the money of it. And I was like, yeah, it might change the surf contest. But um, I think for people who love surfing, it's that act of immersing themselves in Kanaloa that, that will continue and that He'e Nalu is going to continue. Um, you just have to adapt with it, which is what He'e is. He'e is all about adapting. And that's what Kanaloa is, is adapting to him. So it's all intertwined. It's really beautiful. When you um, when you just greet it in that way, um, uh, no, it's bringing up something. So, um, letting it happen and adaptation. What does that mean for prevention? As far as prevention, prevention of it getting worse. Yeah, I mean that. I definitely encourage that. Um, we all. It's not our role to impact our akua, and we're doing that. Like I said, we've been activating things in our atmosphere that don't belong there. We've been, I think Rosie Alagado was talking about how we're polluting our environment. Yeah, we're polluting Kane. Laka herself is getting Haumia because of all the stuff we're putting in her. So her Laka process of that evaporation and transpiration is Haumia now. That is not our role. We should not be doing that. And so the, le the more we can um, make ourselves less reliant on outside resources, the better. Um, and that is something we should push everyone to do. I mean, that's why, um, you know, you can see it in this place here. We're trying not to use generators, trying not to use more resources. It makes for comfort, but it's not something you have to do. And the more, um, we cannot tell the government to change everything when we have a choice ourselves, you know? We can use, I carry my reusable water bottles, I carry my Tupperware with me, like um, plastic is, is not natural. That's pulling out the oil from the earth and changing things. <coughs> um, so yeah, not to be, I mean, we accept our Akua, but we also don't stick our head in the sands and think we cannot do anything about it. It is our role to protect them. It is our role to talk to people about it and make sure that, um, that we have least impact on our Akua as we can.
can you talk a little bit more about Laka and transpiration, like Laka's role? Yeah, so Laka is that, um, that upward movement and that downward movement, yeah? And it's that reciprocal exchange between Kanaka and the Aina, between plants and the Aina, between the sky and the plants. She is what moves the water. She activates it, which is why it's amazing that Laka is the deity of Pula, yeah? Because she's activating those energies. She's activating how we communicate with each other. And so you talk about is when you sweat as a, kana as a Hula dancer, that is Laka being present, you know? When you have your Ahu on you, all your elements on you, that is part of Laka, but then you sweat and you give back to those things. Um, so Laka is present here in the mornings, you know, at that morning when the earth is breathing and stuff. So Kane, to me, is more that, that rain that you see, that penetrating rain, the rain that is visible, and Laka is much more of that activation of the energies in between. Um, so that Slater movement. So she's like evapotranspiration, transpiration, she's transpiration, she's perspiration, she is that that vai that flows. Yeah. Let's see, what other kuas do you guys associate with the Aina movements? With climate change. What is the ku element? Who is ku in all of climate change? What is his role in this, in our Aina? So Ku is, it's not just like Pa'a, but it's also that vertical movement. Yeah, so Ku is um, a, a forest, yeah, like Kumuku Hali'i, he's that forest deity that moves things from the Aina to the heavens. Um, ku Kainali'i, that flooding, yeah, of that Kane action, that rising, that's another Ku function. Um, so we have a lot of rising actions that are going to happen too. Like Kukia Imauna. Kukia Imauna, yeah. That ku function, that standing for it. So standing for the Aina. Um, so climate change to me is divesting from resources, divesting from capitalism. Like all those things where you're trying to externalize our impacts on someone else, all of that has to stop, right? That's Aloha Aina. Right now, we're talking about TMT externalizing the benefits to someone else, and we are the ones feeding the impact. We do that every time we use oil, right? We are impacting someone else's Aina for our benefit. So the least we can do for all of those things, they were acknowledging that their Akuas exist, and they have processes that we're impacting. I talked a little bit about Pele's role in climate change so far. Um, so she, her presence is in the, um, yeah, in her, in the force that she brings to the island, in, in her presence here, in the heat that she brings, she changes the heat. <coughs> Pele responds to Kane, right? So, cause Kane is her father, right? So Kane is up there and she's down here. When she activates, he activates. And so as Kane is activated more and more in climate change, we might see Pele activating more herself too because they respond to each other. Um, you see that in the sunspots. When the sunspots are super active, um, Pele is super active as well. And so right now we're kind of in a calm time. Um, but then all of her, the air, the fog, the sulfur that she brings out, all of those things activate things as well, right? So the sulfur changes how we breathe our air, how the air circulates, um, how things grow. So she, um, she blessed us when she came through um, in Pune last summer because her, her sulfur, her air killed a lot of the invasive species we had there. Yeah? So when you drive through Pune, you see that the Vaivi did not survive and you see these stands of dead Vaivi. Um, but the Ohia are still growing. The kupu kupu are growing, the hapu'u are growing. And so that is when you're talking about native species and how they are, our native species can survive these changes. And maybe this is one way we can, you know, start pushing down on the invasive species that push out our native species. Because our native species are going to be able to survive. They can help 
um, you know, solidified our shorelines. They can help with our kahavais. They bring the rain on these maunas. Um, our Aina A plants don't do that. The Vaivi sucks up water, the eucalyptus sucks up water. Albizia creates, does not create a solid foundation for plants to grow. So all of these things are very impactful. Um, so just, and that's the, um, the, who's the function of the plants, of all the living things? What is all those? What are kuas are activated in that? Laka, who else? Else's are all our living plants. Lono. Yeah, so our lono, yeah. So that's where lono comes into all of this. Is in that growth of all the living things, all our all our feet, our food, maya, all the things that we rely on to gather, that's Lono. So he's interacted, he, in, he relies on Kane, but he relies on us also, yeah? So we need to activate Lono. So Lono Ika Makahiki, when we do our Makahiki ceremonies, those are times when we're changing seasons, right? So we're going from Kane to Kanaloa when we're going into Makahiki season. And so those are those transitions that we see climate change the most also. So like right now, we're gonna go through hurricane season. We're going through that now. Um, and then when Makahiki comes, we're kind of transitioning out of it. Yeah, and that's when you, you thank him for coming and helping us get out of this. Um, yeah, when we're in hurricane season, that's Kane right there, yeah? That's when he's super strong. That's when his heat energy is interacting with Kanaloa in the equator and just being super, super active. And that's, that's the changes we're gonna feel the most are those sudden changes that yeah, we talked about. So the hurricanes are gonna increase. When we talk about the decrease in rainfall, rainfall's been going down for 30 years, but those spikes are super huge now, right? So when Kane comes, he's gonna come raging. Kanaloa, when he's gonna be steady, the climate rise or the sea level rise isn't gonna be very fast, but when he comes, he's gonna flood us like those king tides. All those things are what we're gonna expect going forward. Um, so it's not something that we have to think is out of place. It's something we have to learn how to, to prepare for. Um, so, um. What can you share about the Kiahio Lapa Bay? Because I live right there and it's so beautiful. Um, it's created its own weather pattern. Yeah, well, actually, every place on our island has their own weather pattern, right? So we just have to know our weather patterns. But yeah, Kiahia Laka, um, that's the east rift zone of Kilauea. And so Kilauea itself, um, as the lava comes up under our islands, you know, there is a reservoir under there, that magma reservoir. Um, and, that, and then it finds pukas that are soft that it comes up through. And so right now, it's coming up through Kilauea, the East Rift Zone, which is part of Mauna Loa. So underneath it's all connected and it's um, connected to um, the new Mokupuni coming up as well. So all of that is under the same and it just kind of pukas in different places. But because of that, we know there's extra heat in those areas. All that magma is stored, that heat energy. And it might not be something that scientists can measure, but it doesn't mean that we don't understand those energies are there. Yeah, so those energies are there creating their own. So the, that heat pattern that it creates is unique to that place. Yeah, and that's I think where a lot of that laka comes in and brings different things, might bring in more of these mist rains. Um, the way the, the trade winds bounce off of our mauna, bounce off of our slopes are all really unique. Um, and we just have to understand those patterns. And those patterns were changed based on what direction. Um, our Makanis are going, coming from, but again, like I said, that's like that Kanaloa. It's coming from the west. We're not getting as much of our trade winds coming from the east, and that's because Kanaloa and his heat patterns and how he circulates the heat energy of ocean is is being shifted, um, and they don't understand that much, um, but we know it's happening. Yeah, those things are. It, they are connected to Kanaloa, right? So they're gonna be connected to our kuas of the ocean. So our manos are gonna change. The migrations of the koholas might start to change. Like all of those things are all integrated now with even how Pele changes. Yeah. So those migration stories are ones we have to go back to. The, um, all the stories that talk about how um, 
our akuas have migrated in the past are going to be important for us to see going forward. <coughs> like I constantly read that mo'olelo and try to see how this mano traveled throughout our islands, who he met, where he met, what those things, those stories can share us as we think about our oceans changing. Um, and who is supposed to live where? And are they still living there? Or are they moving? Are they changing places now? So maybe for those of you guys who've kind of just joined us, um, I am Noe Punivai. I am a faculty in Hawaiian Studies at Kamakakua Kalani. I teach Malama Aina. My background though is in science. I've been a marine ecologist, environmental scientist for a long time. And I really want to allow our Kanaka to understand our Akua so we understand these environmental changes that we're going to be going through through climate change. Um, and so there's just those conversations that I want to make sure we're having that we understand our environment's changing, but these are our same Akuas. And how do we greet our Akuas? How do we understand who they are as they change, um, as they greet us in new ways? Um, are we being present in those spaces with them? Um, so if you have any questions, I'm open to questions. I don't know everything about climate change, but I know it's, I've been really activated by these conversations because um, as I meet people from around the world, it's these indigenous people who are rising up and being super active in the climate change realm because we are the ones who are going to be impacted the most. But we're going to be impacted in ways, hopefully, that are helpful to us, that will help us reclaim our ainas, reclaim our places, <coughs> um, and just awaken everybody else to the changes that are going on um, and start decolonizing our, the way we associate with the environment. Climate change isn't a white doesn't have to be a white western ideal we have to accept that our aina is changing and be a part of that so most of the um the native americans um, alaska natives that we greet with you know we are the ones feeling it first but we are the ones that are going to be resilient if we're there for each other and to help each other um, so we know our alaskan brothers and sisters have have already been feeling it in the north just like the pacific islands have um, places like Louisiana, the indigenous people there, they've lost almost 85% um, of their lands are gone already um, because of all these changes. Um, but they're hopeful, you know, and it makes their people rise up and get stronger together. And I think this is our chance to let's re-envision a new Hawaii. Without a Waikiki, what can we do? How do we repurpose other people who work there? We have Aina still to work. Let's work our Aina. Let's feed ourselves. Um, but we do have to re-envision new places and we need to akahele about how we use our resources. So vai, our kane is precious resource. Um, we need to malama it. Kanaloa is a precious resource. We can't think that we can tell him where to go or how he should act on our shores. We have to adapt to how he's going to come to us. Any other comments? Anybody want to share some stories? of Kane or Kanaloa and how they've changed as you've seen them change. I shared a little bit about, you know, how Poliahu is not as present anymore as she once was. Anything else? I know the salt makers in Kauai, you know, they talk a lot about it. Their salt making practices are being completely affected. Um, and they're different. I mean, when I talk to people from Kauai, we have hard rocky shorelines here. Sea level rise isn't something that we really worry about on Hawaii Island because we don't have things on the shore. We don't have sand shifting and shifting our coastlines much. But you know, that's places that Kauai and Maui really have to worry about and Oahu's North Shore has to worry about. Waikiki, um, it's all how we move the way. And they adapt by planting their akuas back on the maunas, yeah? yeah and planting kalo to create watersheds. And, yeah. and they had the road closed, so they had a lot of healing and oh. a lot of work then. But now it's, yeah. it's going to be it's open. Yeah. yeah. Like for Mauna Kea, 
that they're planting more mamane trees mm -hmm. to help um, and they're planting it along the contour line so that it can um, help bring in the fog and attract the fog drip to replenish the aquifer. I mean, that's, I think they're planting koa too, but it's a lot of mixed plantings. Yeah. yeah. So our that was that when we we're talking about Lono. I mean, we've changed the water cycle ourselves outside of climate change just because we've deforested our slopes. Yeah. So without our forest, this should have been forest. Everything you see now is not supposed to be grassland. The grassland area is up there. This should have been forest, but it was all grazed. And without the forest, we don't bring vai, yeah? So the vai, we change the water cycle it is. Lanai is the case study for that. You see all the stories from Lanai. Once they lost their watershed, they lost their rain. Um, and they have to plant their watershed to get back their rain. So it's this cycle that you have to do. Koholave is the same way. It's not the bombing that killed Koholave. It was the overgrazing that killed Koholave. So as we lost those akuas, those processes couldn't happen anymore. And that's what we're seeing here too. So we do need to plant our forests to bring back that water cycle and to make sure they still survive. The cloud patterns are changing. We talk about how the cloud levels are rising higher now, right? So just as temperatures are changing and our temperatures are rising at higher elevations, faster than they are on the bottom, that's why Poliahu cannot come anymore. It's because it's too warm for her to come. It's not just because of just the changing patterns in rainfall, it's all the changing patterns in heat. And so that heat changes the pressure differentials in the clouds, so our clouds are gonna be changing. They're sitting at different levels. They're gonna get squeezed in between and they're gonna hit less places of our mauna. But as we bring back our forest, hopefully we can attract it to come further down. Hopefully we can cool down those slopes and stop the rising temperatures on our mauna a little bit. Um, so yeah, the planting of our native species are super important <coughs> to make sure that we can attract water in the future. Yeah, and we've changed all of that. So Mauna Loa, I don't think has the same effect as Mauna Kea because Mauna Loa hasn't been deforested as much as Mauna Kea. Most of the Ka'u side of Mauna Loa is still intact with native forests. And that keeps its rain cycles very similar to what it was in the past. Any other questions or comments you guys have? I know we're kind of finishing up here, the first the first round, but I just want to make sure people are, are being activated in it. Um, Auntie Kale has her whole Ai Kalama, um, where you try to, to disengage from your resources every full moon. You know, just doing your little bit you can to say that I'm not going to use as much oil, I'm not going to impact someone else's, because everything that you have around you it came from somewhere. Um, and we are the ones that are creating the climate change. It's not politicians, it's not other people around the world. Each one of us has a role in that. So the least we can impact our resources, the better. Because it is coming. We can prevent it as much as we can by being activated, but we can't um, ignore the fact that it's, it's coming and it's changing. Are there any concepts with the environmental changes you guys are kind of don't quite understand how it works? Um, ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is something that we haven't felt the effects really largely of here in Hawaii and that's because we have so much vai, fresh water flowing that we buffer our oceans really well. So Kanaloa, our Kane, our, our presence of Kane really protects Kanaloa. But ocean acidification is going to really be a big impact. It's going to make it really hard for our corals to grow, for all our shells to grow, all our species that grow a shell, um, kupees, pipipis, opihis, all of those guys are really going to start hurting soon. Um, and that is something that, you know, is that bigger concept that it's hard to adjust to. But the healthier and cleaner we can keep our oceans, it's probably the only best way we can do it. They don't talk about it, but um, there's a lot of, like I said, Hawaii, we're kind of in a safe bubble here where we're not feeling the heavy impacts like other places. But Washington State has had such, their oceans are so acidified that they can't even grow their own oysters for the last 10 years already. 
we grow the oysters that you buy in California and Oregon. We raise them here because they're babies, their larval cannot settle because the oceans aren't healthy enough for them. So here in Hilo, we raise 90% of the brood stock for all the oyster industry on the mainland. They're all from Kyokaha. And that's because we started, a, or the PACRIC, the Pacific Aquaculture and Coastal Resource Center, started a program 10 years ago because we have, our waters are still clean enough and they're not acidified enough to do that. And then we ship them up and once they're older, they're a little stronger and then they can grow up in their waters, but they haven't been growing up in their waters. So there's a lot of people that, that rely on Hawaii for these larger efforts. Um, places like the shrimp industry, we have the brood stock, the bee industry, we have the mamas here, right? All the queens all come from Hawaii. So we play a really important role in safeguarding um, sort of the mamas as we go forward. And that's something we can continue to do here in Hawaii is to create those safe spaces for our food plants, you know, maybe for our more of our brothers and sisters in the south who are having too much saltwater inundation. We can create plants here that can um, adapt to it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Okay, so I can I'm gonna probably leave it as that. I think we're kind of wrapping up our session, but I just really encourage you guys to get to know Kane and Kanalor and all our akuas because that's the best way we can greet them as we go forward. Yeah, you want to tell them about Kane? What you know about Kane? You don't know him? Well, we need to go home and get used to him. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Enjoy the other sessions.